Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to talk about the Kimberley Rock Art Dating Project that I've been leading for the last seven years now, I think. And it's just been a fantastic privilege to be able to be involved with the uh, remarkable um, rock art of the Kimberley and particularly with the, the traditional owners of the area, the people of the Queenie uh, group in the North Kimberley who uh, have been so good to us and whose country we have been guests on. Um, the project is the aim of the, the rock art dating project is clearly from its name to date the rock art, but it was very clear to me right at the outset of setting the project up that we really had to understand the, uh, the context of the art. It's not, they're not just paintings sitting on a canvas on a passive surface. Uh, these, are, these are dynamic, evolving geological environments. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today, is trying to understand the geology of that. But we can't leave this with, uh, without um, saying something about the rock art. It is uh, a quite astonishing um, national treasure, really. The, uh, there are tens of thousands of rock art sites across the sandstone terrains of the Kimberley. And these are exceptional in so many ways. They are, the, the sheer abundance is one thing, the sheer artistic skill of the people who made it and the, the sheer sense of wonder that you get when you look at it. It, it, most Australians know we have some rock paintings up in northern Australia and elsewhere around the country, but it's only when you get the privilege of going and seeing some of this thing, that some of these things in uh, their, their own environment that you really start to appreciate them. Um, the project really builds strongly on the work of others uh, who have looked at the rock art and made observations over it, particularly the late Graham Walsh and uh, David Welsh from Darwin and many others who have established a chronology, a relative chronology for the rock art. They've established a sequence of changing rock art styles. And if you look at the three uh, paintings over on the right here, there's the, the, the earliest painted style is the naturalistic paintings or irregular infill animal paintings, they're often called, uh, because the, the the painted subjects are almost entirely animals. And then later on in the kind of middle period, the focus of the paintings changes completely to people and people in ceremonial dress conducting ceremony. Um, and the most recent phase is the Wanjina phase, um, which is continuous with the modern culture and the local um, indigenous uh, uh, people identify very strongly with that. But this has been established, I and mean, it's very like the geological timescale. It was established by uh, superimposition of one painting style upon another. You can see these little anthropomorphic figures here superimposed on this dot painted um, macropod, large kangaroo. And you can see all the way through that there are paint, there's painting on painting. And by looking at that and un unraveling that sequence, this uh, uh, quite a complex sequence of styles has been established. The oldest being rock markings, uh, the sort of cupules or ground grooves, followed by the first painted style, which is that naturalistic period uh, with wonderful paintings of animals, typically filled in by this irregular hatching pattern or sometimes a dotted pattern, followed by the Guion period or Guion Guion period, uh, formerly called the Bradshaws, which are these anthropomorphic figures dancing and, and conducting ceremony, but very um, strongly decorated with uh, a ceremonial dress. That becomes somewhat more stylized into these more static figures, but multiple pigments were introduced at about that time rather than simply the iron oxide ochres. Uh, then the painted hand period, and then finally the glorious uh, Wanjina period with these um, wonderful spirit beings painted in multi-coloured uh, pigments. So if we didn't have that, if we were uh, successful in gaining a, obtaining a date on any individual painting, it would relate only to that painting. But because of this sequence, we're very much like we were with the geological time scale at the end of the 19th century. We have this relative time scale, but we didn't have uh, dates on it. But today I'm not going to talk about the dating. I might mention a couple of dates in passing, but the um, really there's a whole lot of geological considerations that I want to look at. But why is the rock art 
sites located where they are in the landscape and what is the control on that and how do the rock shelters form and, and evolve because if these are evolving quite rapidly then clearly we would never find uh, paintings of any great antiquity so the pro geomorphic process rates are really uh, extraordinary and we want to know if these process rates are ultimately the, the constraint on the maximum age of painting that we'll ever find or are the rock shelters able to survive long enough uh, for the even the earliest paintings to be uh, found there still. So there's a whole lot of uh, key questions about the surface processes and the survival, uh, the, the, the criteria that limit the survival of rock paintings that we want to, um, to look at. So I just just briefly cover the the, the Paleoproterozoic geology of the the northern part of the Kimberley Basin, uh, where I've sort of used rather lurid colours, particularly to accentuate the Wharton sandstone, because all of the essentially all of the work we've done so far has been on sites within the Wharton sandstone, and particularly. Uh, along the escarpment and above the escarpment of the, the so-called Carson escarpment that runs along the edge of the Wharton sandstone where it overlies the uh, Carson volcanics here, a, a flood basalt province, large igneous province, which is uh, mostly produces relatively little outcrop over much of its range, it does in these hills around here, but those outcrops, uh, because it's basalt, they are, are chemically weathering quite rapidly and there's not much, there's very little rock art preserved, a few engravings in a few sites, and that's about it. Um, but the rock art is also abundant in what used to be called the uh, King Leopold sandstone, now the one I'm in, uh, Miliwandi sandstone, rather a mouthful, um, but that also produces beautiful environments for rock art to be preserved. So those two units are really the dominant control. But if we just look at a satellite image of the area, you can see the Carson Volcanics picked out in the green here and the Wharton Sandstone and the Pentecost Sandstone over to the right. Um, Graham Walsh and, and Mike Morwood um, back in the late 90s and around 2000 produced a distribution map of the different styles of um, rock art. This is the distribution that a very, a very rough outline of scattered sites where Guion paintings are found, often at very high concentration, but are not so much around the edge. And the yellow is the Wanjina showing essentially the same boundary along the eastern side. And, and people have often thought of this as being some kind of cultural boundary. Um, but, but, um, but really, is it? Um, that's one of the first questions uh, we can look at. If we go back to the geology here, in the blue over on this side is the Pentecost sandstone, the upper most of the, these uh, cyclical sandstone sequences. And the Pentecost just doesn't produce the right sort of outcrop. If you fly over it, you just see these low rubbly hills just covered by scattered boulders of rock, never much more than half a metre across, and certainly no uh, large uh, clean faces that you could paint anything on. So that boundary is in fact not a cultural boundary at all. It is in fact a geological one. The Wharton sandstone in the purple here is in fact the really the uppermost limit of the suitable materials, um, for the suitable rocks for forming um, surfaces on which to paint. And here we have the Wanaman uh, Milawandi sandstone, beautiful vertical surfaces, on these um, scattered blocky outcrops and similarly in the Wharton. The Wharton is typically uh, slightly more finely uh, bedded than the Leopold. You get some very massive clean quartz sandstones in the, in the, uh, uh, the Milawandi sandstone. Uh, in the Wharton, it's, it's large channel sandstones in places, but interbedded with finer shaley units. And similarly, there are some shaley units within the, um, it just in very fine individual beds within the Wanaman uh, Milawandi sandstone. But the Pentecost sandstone is essentially out because it just doesn't produce the right sorts of outcrops. In some coastal contexts, there might be, but mostly over most of its range is not. So that's our first order constraint on where the, geolo where the uh, rock 
um, paintings can, with the rock shelters containing the paintings can occur. And I'm not the first to note that. Um, uh, Mike Donaldson has noted this, one of our geological fraternity has noted this uh, previously. If we look at one of the escarpments in the, in the Wharton sandstone, and everything I'm going to be talking about from now on is in the, the Wharton, um, we see these big prominent cliffs, uh, and if you fly along them in the helicopter, you see lots of uh, recent rock falls where this is a, a most of the uh, landscape evolution, most of the erosion in this landscape is taking place by mass wasting on those large escarpments. But at the bottom of those, at the top of the scree slope, at the bottom is one place where you uh, tend to find rock shelters. And the other place is along these sort of more blocky outcrops it's a sort of a large etched surface, really, that, that the, the uh, formerly quite deep lateritic soils have been stripped off from, going back, I think, probably at least to the Miocene. But in under these rocky overhangs are uh, magnificent places to get uh, rock shelters for the, for the rock art. And a couple of examples are shown here, this large sort of mushroom rock uh, with some paintings in here. Uh, very well sheltered from the elements and very little, if any, actual erosion is going on in these sheltered environments. Here's another one in under here, hidden behind the vegetation, and that's very typical of what these sites look like. So I'm going to show you a couple of little 3D models now of uh, some of these things so we can get an idea of the form of these rock surfaces. You tend to have horizontal uh, ceilings and then generally a backward facing main face a rounded lower surface and then going into a, the deepest part of the cave at the bottom. In this one you can see a, a rock block here that's detached from the, the main face and you can see the legs here of this Guion figure up here. It's, uh, if we can date the uh, time of that little rock fall for example we would have a minimum age for that painting and we do actually have a, a date on some mineral accretions within that particular shelter. Here's another one here. You can see the same little overhang at the top. There's a much bigger overhang out of the photo, a backward sloping uh, rock face that is painted and these rounded lower surfaces. It tends to be a sharp boundary between the ceiling and the upper surface here. And another one here, these are some of the, uh, the, the uh, multicolored or the sort of bichrome, there are two pigments here, the pale one has largely disappeared and you'll see parts missing, like the head is missing here because it was painted in a pale of pigment and over here, but exquisitely painted, but the same sorts of features of the rock surface and then a magnificent Wanjina site here, this is a huge site, it's about 30 meters long and every square inch of the, of the whole surface is painted. It's the most amazingly glorious thing to, to see. But you see the same thing, vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal ceiling panels, backward facing and rounded uh, forms to the back walls and penetrating deep into the deepest part of the shelter underneath here. So if we look ahead, just a static picture of one of those shelters, the horizontal ceiling, a relatively sharp cornice along here between the ceiling and the back wall, a backward sloping back wall, rounded lower surfaces, uh, going back into very deep, four or five metres deeper in many cases to the lower part of the shelter, and a very rocky floor. And if you look at multiple sites like that, you'll see these same features uh, represented again and again. The deepest part of the shelter is invariably right at ground level, right at the base. And the, and the floors are mostly rocky. It's challenging for the archeologists that we work with to find uh, shelters which have a significant sediment accumulation in them where they can actually do an, uh, an excavation. Uh, here's another one here. And in many cases, you can actually see fallen slabs from the, the, the bed represented by this back wall here. And you can reconstruct these quite precisely as to exactly where they came from. And this is extremely useful to us. So in many of these, you can, you can reconstruct exactly where these fallen slabs were. But many of them are still there. And many of these are rock shelters, the, the cave interior is really defined by a pile of fallen slabs on the outer surface. 
So here we have uh, the, the various elements that I've just been outlining. With these horizontal ceilings uh, up here, the backward sloping, typically, sometimes they're vertical, but mostly backward sloping. Uh, the deepest part of the cave is always at the bottom. And very often these rounded uh, lower surfaces are accentuated um, by uh, uh, spallation. Uh, like at this position. So the sharp upper corners, the rounded lower corners, and these uh, rounded uh, surfaces accentuated by spallation and, and a pile of multiple slabs typically on the, on the floor. So it's fairly, it's fairly obvious that how these things are formed. Here's one of these very deeply um, excavated uh, slot surfaces, which is where a, a a less competent bed, a shaley bed has been excavated out and there's massive sandstone here just waiting to uh, collapse and another one that's been excavated up here. So these, uh, these undermined um, surfaces, undermined lower parts of the caves, they go back four or five metres in many cases, sometimes only two or three. But if you, some, you very often see little pillars preserved of the uh, shaley um, bands between the massive sandstones. And these typically have uh, sort of an hourglass form. They have concave outer surfaces on them. You can see the same thing over here. Um, and these are actually um, under enormous compression and they are actually physically collapsing under the, under the weight of the overlying rock. And very often these, these sort of slot caves, if you like, are only a half a metre to a metre high. Uh, some of the surfaces, some of these back walls, if you see a large single uh, surface, they are clearly formed by a single fracture. Um, the, the, where you get a more massive sandstone, here, this one here is about two metres high and it has life-size guion figures on it. The headdresses are up here. Can't really see it from this angle, but a magnificent uh, site that was found a few years ago. Uh, here's the, the, the horizontal ceiling. The ceiling is basically a bedding plane and the very sharp junction where this uh, the uh, bed below it has fractured. Uh, the upper part of it is almost invariably backward sloping, but you can see it's a large curved and it's actually on the thicker ones, you see this is more or less a spherical segment but on the thinner beds, it's, it's mostly just sloping away from you as you're looking into the shelter. These things in many ways are like a huge conchoidal fracture uh, and they have, have taken place in, in a single collapse event. Here you see slightly a bit of spallation along this lower surface on a very rounded surface and you can see the spallation going on, accentuating that roundness down here. Uh, so here's some more of those rounded surfaces, spallation occurring along here. Some older ones that have actually been painted over there. Some older spallation events have taken place. Another one here, another one there. Another one along, cutting off the bottom of these Guion figures. So putting all that together, those observations about the form of these shelters, you can, you can reconstruct fairly easily how they're formed. And it's well, when I started looking at this, I started trying to read up about what had been written about uh, rock shelters and caves in sandstone environments. And there's, um, you basically have to look very hard to find, um, you know, I think I found one volume by, uh, by Bob Young about sandstone cave shelters, but fairly general and not with the, uh, the specific observations uh, that relate to what we're doing here. But you compare this with an entire shelf of volumes on limestone caves, which have been written about um, uh, in enormous detail. Very, very little has been written about these kinds of uh, shelters. So if we look at a little cross section of typically one of these shelters, here's one at an early stage here, and the forces operating this, of course, are the, the uh, a gravity um, producing a, a very strong uh, turning moment on the, on the uh, poorly supported sandstone bed at the bottom here, but tremendous pressure on even some of these relatively small um, rock masses. You're probably talking about tens of thousands of tonnes of overlying rock, all focused on this very weak shaley 
bed at the bottom, this rather incompetent thing. And because these are always near ground level, there's probably water seepage going on through here as well. And there is compressional failure going on in these very weak, incompetent beds. So you get this erosional undermining, but it's not, an, it's not basically a, an abrasion uh, going on, which is one of the main mechanisms whereby uh, sandstone overhangs develop on uh, river courses is by physical abrasion. This, that's not happening here. Um, they, you get this undermining and removal of material by mechanisms or small animals, who knows, uh, operating in those environments. So the net effect of all this is, is eventually fractures develop and the whole ceiling collapses. And this, is, uh, this really defines an instant in time, which is very important from the point of view of the geological dating of the rock art. It creates the, the new back surface and a new ceiling, which are these sites for, these are beautiful uh, contexts to, uh, for paintings. And um, you can find multiple, I mean, most of the rock art is on these kinds of surfaces. They have to be younger than the time of that slab fall. But occasionally you'll find a painted ceiling, which has then itself fallen. And these, these cave, caves or shelters gradually enlarge by multiple um, rock slab falls of this kind. But very often the slabs slide outwards. There's usually a, a bit of a slope in front of the, the rock shelter and they slide outwards and then they become um, available. They become exposed to maybe half the sky or a third of the sky and, and uh, hit by a high energy cosmic rays from space creating um, the tiny amounts of um, beryllium 10 and aluminium 26, which can be used for uh, cosmogenic radionuclide uh, exposure dating. And we've done this on a whole lot of these um, fallen slabs. And we now have, have uh, cave forming slab events that uh, is the youngest is that's reasonably well measured is about 9,000 years, but you'll see a, a fairly continuous progression of ages up to almost quarter of a million years. Uh, and the shelters are still there. We've seen, seen some falls that I think probably I would, I'd be very surprised if they were more than 10 years old, but they're not happening at a very great rate. And some of these rock shelters are certainly surviving for tens of thousands of years and uh, others up to hundreds of thousands of years, which is great from the point of view of trying to date the, uh, the rock art uh, within them. So I've sort of speculated a bit about um, how the, this failure occurs, trying to put some of these observations together. If we, if we look at a sandstone bed here and we're, it's operating, we've got gravity creating the, the sort of turning, the bending moment on the outer edge, we're getting gradual weakening by uh, sort of erosion along opening up the bedding plane. So it's becoming detached here. And there is some sort of fulcrum for underlying support underneath. And we'll create, a, we'll create tensile fractures within that, which are going to tend to be vertical. Um, and, and of course, the collapse and the rock um, slab will fall. Now, I've been trying to think, well, how do you get these, this very consistent pattern of the largely backward sloping fractures? They're mostly not vertical. Some of them are, but most of them aren't. And so I thought, well, maybe you can do this by shifting the fulcrum uh, further back. It's unsupported, but still only penetrating the, the uh, loosening of that bedding plane uh, back to some point. Perhaps that leads to a, a rotation of the, uh, of the, the plane of uh, tensile fracture and again, the collapse of that slab. But if we look at what's happening to the, um, the crushing that is visible within uh, some of the finer sandstone, some of the sandstone beds themselves, but also particularly those shaley um, inter um, sandstone units, which, which cause the undermining in the first place, um, it's, it, I think that there's compressional fracture going on. And in it, for those of you who are rock mechanics experts, I very much value your opinions on this. But I think that would tend to produce, so vertical uh, compression will tend to produce, of course, a, a, a rearward facing fracture and probably those, those large spherical shells where you can see them uh, on, on a larger scale. And if one of the things when you go into some of these rock shelters and you've got, you, know, you think you've got 100,000 tonnes of rock above you in some of the really big ones at the bottom of those escarpments, 
you see that the some of these beds are actually being crushed um, by that uh, that uh, the compression from the overburden there. So you see lots of this kind of uh, compressional failure going on. So I don't think that the, these uh, compressional failure, this mechanism is unreasonable for that kind of surface. And if we look at the, uh, the stress distribution around a tunnel um, that's, that's excavated from a mine or a roadway or something, the, the, the uh, trajectories of the lines of uh, compressive stress are, are deflected around the tunnel here in the middle. Um, and that creates, of course, the maximum compression is vertical here, but it creates a dilational uh, force around the sides, and they are the areas that are most likely to fail. And they do so by this sort of uh, flaking, uh, typically, or in, you know, if it's much deeper, of course, you get rock bursts, and you certainly don't want to be near one of those. But this, uh, this sort of uh, dilational uh, flaking around the edge is typical of these kinds of uh, stresses. And if you look at some of the weaker sandstones around the uh, backs of some of these, now this is usually above the, the very deeply penetrating uh, undermining at the base, but some of the beds above that, you get exactly that kind of uh, tensile uh, flaking along the edges. And these are, I mean, at first I thought these were some kind of salt weathering or something like that, but they're not. There is absolutely no efflorescence involved. This is a purely physical fracturing that is going on. And I think that it is due to the compressional forces from the overlying rock. And they're just massively fractured here, another one over here. There's no chemical uh, effects visible at all uh, in the other one here. So, yeah, just um, here's some more examples of that rounding of the lower surfaces by later spallation that occurs. So but the, the model that I'm putting together for this is that we have the, the, the process is initiate, initiated by erosional excavation of the weak layers near ground level, typically, then brittle failure of the rock slabs under compression or just a simple flexure under tension. Um, the enlargement of the rock shelters by successive roof slab falls, the rounding of the sharper convex surfaces by spallation, and then uh, the exposed surfaces generally become the sites for mineral accretion, which is what I'm going to just talk about next to, um, for the last part of the talk. We've done a lot of work on the mineral accretions that occur within the um, within these uh, rock shelters. And we've found that they actually, I mean, there, there's a tremendous variety of these, but if you actually look at them, uh, they form in, in consistent patterns. And we've developed four different kinds of rock um, mineral accretions that are found on the rock surfaces by their consistent association, by their physical characteristics, um, and, the, and their the clear differences in the, the water flow pathways or airflow in one case that are responsible for them. So we'll start with these polychrome fringes. These are, these are produced chromatographically where water is flowing down over the rock surfaces. It's either dripping from near the, the, the drip line around the edge of the ceiling or it's flowing inwards. It's diffusing across the rock surface from the edge. Um, and you get chromatography going on and you get separation of the various constituents and precipitating a range of minerals dominated by sulfates. Gypsum is by far the most common um, and, and a variety of uh, other uh, calcium sulfates. You get bassanite, the hemihydrate, and you get anhydrite as well in some cases. You get a, a bunch of oxalates, particularly huolite, the uh, hydrated calcium oxalate mineral, and less frequently wetolite, uh, a different variety of calcium oxalate, and you get you get small amounts of magnesium phosphates in these as well, which are particularly important because they are consistently uranium bearing. And so these ones are around the edges of the rock shelter, and they are um, on vertical walls and horizontal ceilings, and they are color banded laterally, and they react with and they bleach the pigments. Here's a little, just a little. Uh, um, site with a very minimal rock overhang protecting it. And you can see these uh, lateral polychrome fringes where you're getting the, from water flow out here during the wet season, you're getting diffusion of moisture across the surface and precipitation of these various um, minerals there. But you can also see that the, uh, 
These are encroaching on the painted, on the rock paintings here. And ahead of the visible mineral accretion, there is a zone where you get bleaching of the iron oxide pigments, principally hematite and girthite in these paintings. And that can really only happen two ways. One is, by, is a microbial by getting iron reducing um, bacteria that can reduce the iron in the three plus state down to the, the two plus where it becomes soluble. But much more likely is that it's, uh, it's the oxalates. You're getting oxalic acid, uh, oxalate in solution here. And that is, uh, you know, as most mineral collectors know, that is a wonderful way of cleaning up iron oxide stains on mineral specimens. But it certainly deals very effectively with uh, rock paintings. So that is potentially one of the threats to the survival of these uh, rock paintings. The other one uh, I'll deal with just very quickly are the dispersed wall coatings. These are clearly formed by seepage on the bedding plane that defines the ceiling and it just uh, material diffusing down and precipitating over that rock surface. These are often, you can, even in the dry season, these are often quite damp up here and they are mostly uh, sulfates and some oxalates, they react with the pigments in some cases to produce big accumulations of calcium oxalates replacing the pigment in this case. And they form this general apron on the back wall and they have this white powdery appearance and they can be destructive to the pigments. One of the most interesting one of the, what we've been calling floor glazes, not a perfect description of them, but the, the term is, um, really in reference to the fact that these are highly glossy. They're very difficult to stand up on. We mostly take our boots and socks off and walk around in bare feet, or you, you end up sort of uh, doing a very nasty injury to yourself. Uh, these are extraordinarily laminated. They're finely laminated and the laminae are continuous across the whole rock surface. And they form patterns of thick and thin laminations uh, which get up to three, even four millimetres thick at the most. Most of them are only one to two millimetres thick, but within that there are multiple laminations, which we, form, we think are forming by microbial action, particularly during the wet season. And these patterns of the laminations are actually correlated from one site to another over an area of 2,000 square kilometres. And that is astonishing. We've got a paper coming out in... Uh, uh, science advances uh, shortly, which will detail that. But they are a mixture of sulfates and calcium oxalates. Oxalates are the dominant in this group, probably roughly equal to the sulfates and minor magnesium phosphates in them as well. They typically coat low angle surfaces, typically on the floors, on the fallen slabs, uh, and on small ledges on the walls. And um, these are very often associated with patterns of ground grooves, which are exploiting the, uh, the softness of the hewolite, the oxalate and the gypsum, um, uh, to making them very easy to scratch compared to the hard ortho quartzites underneath. And, the, and these, sometimes you'll see these are associated with fresh patches of uh, animal urine, from little animals weeing on the rocks over the last night or two. And I don't think these are actually largely precipitating from the urine directly, but they are providing a nutrient medium for and a source of ions for microbes to uh, live on them. And the final one of these, I won't deal with that. They're little silica uh, skins, wrinkly skins of, of uh, quartz and uh, amorphous silica in some cases and little silica stalagmites. But if you look at some of these very scungy, scab-like mineral accretions under an electron microscope, under an SEM, you see that there are amazing uh, uh, areas of crystal growth. And, and some of these, of course, you see these discoid things and you'd look at that. When you look at it in hand specimen, these botryoidal surfaces of black material, you'd think they're manganese oxides, but they're in fact, they're dominated by sulfates. Um, so that's, uh, you get gypsum there, you get anhydrite crystals forming, you get uh, bassanite, the hemihydrite uh, over here, and you get nubriite, which uh, it was a mineral I must admit I'd never heard of when I started this work. And most people, most geologists probably haven't, first described in piles of bat guano in the, uh, some of the uh, bioduct caves in Western Victoria, named after James Cosmo Newbury, the first government analyst in Victoria. Um, 
But this is a magnesium phosphate mineral and it is consistently uranium bearing, has PPM levels of uranium, quite easy to measure with modern instruments. And in many of the uh, cases, you get larger crystals of these up 20, 30, 40 microns across and not shown in this particular image, but in other sites, you see beautiful crystals of the calcium oxalate huolite, which of course is a carbon bearing mineral. And we've been spent a lot of work in the last two years figuring out how to clean up pure oxalate material, get it free of other organic carbon and to date it with AMS radiocarbon dating. And it's proving to be a beautiful uh, material for uh, radiocarbon dating. People have been attempting to date oxalates for, for many years now, 20 odd years, but uh, we think that that's now got to the point of being reliable. And the Newburyite we're still working on, but it has great potential for uranium thorium dating. So we get a, uh, if you just do an XRD trace on a whole lot of scan on a whole lot of these, you'll find dozens of different weird minerals that you've, you know, half of which you've never heard of. And people have published lists of these and it doesn't mean very much. The dominant ones, they boil down to being sulfates, oxalates and phosphates of calcium, magnesium, and to a much lesser degree, potassium. Occasionally ammonium is present as an iron, presumably also coming from the urine. Uh, and and uh, silica, some of which is just windblown dust, and you get little bits of uh, clays as well from windblown dust. But some of the silica is forming as an amorphous silica um, and then cryptocrystalline silica in situ, but it's relatively minor volumetrically compared to the sulfates and the oxalates, which dominate. Importantly, there's no carbonates in it, almost entirely absent from these things, which was frustrating initially because uh, obviously calcite is the prime target for uranium thorium dating, but in fact, the magnesium phosphates look like they're shaping up as a potential material. And the final thing I just wanted to mention in closing was is really that the ultimate constraint on the survival of the rock art we've demonstrated is not the rock shelters. The rock shelters, some of them, of course, you know, they can be painted on and they can collapse within a relatively short time. But many of them have been there for tens of thousands of years and the rock art is not limited in its survival by the by its host shelter. But ultimately it's exfoliation of these heavily encrusted mineralized surfaces. Um, and painted, uh, which causes the, the gradual flaking off uh, of the surface and the total loss of the, uh, of the paintings, which is very sad to see. So um, trying to conserve these remarkable rock paintings will really involve a lot more care in looking at how to stabilize these surfaces against exfoliation. If you look in, in detail at some of these, there's a little exfoliation flake, and it's clear that uh, this was it was either painted over or in fact the pigment had penetrated through uh, the, the little exfoliation flake. Uh, it's hard to tell but I suspect from the sharpness of the outline that the paint was actually over this little little flake. Uh, there's lots of it, it's been going on a long time. One thing that is important though is if you get a lot of vegetation growing into the rock shelters, if you get an intense fire that can dramatically accelerate the exfoliation. All those little exfoliation flakes, which are, are one day going to fall, they all do it at once. So um, protecting these sites from um, penetration of, of flammable material. Um, one of the greatest disasters, of course, has been a, a site in Kakadu where they actually built a viewing platform in the rock shelter and they built it out of recycled plastic. And once this got underway, it just it, it completely destroyed the site. There's hardly anything left of the through this exfoliation mechanism. But that rarely happens from the natural controlled uh, early uh, dry season burns, which are occurring all the time. Most of those don't cause any problem. So to conclude with the the um, the rock art is clearly restricted, largely just to those two sandstone formations. The shelters formed by a mechanism of undermining and collapse, and in that. Uh, they, are, they are continuously evolving, but some of them survive to ages of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, the formation mechanisms, of course, create the very surfaces on which the rock paintings are produced. Uh, 
and they, the shelters are sufficiently protected from the elements that they provide protection of those surfaces from normal erosion uh, over those similar time frames. And the mineral accretions, uh, some of those laminated floor glazes that we've dated, we've got radiocarbon dates on those oxalates in a continuous succession going back to uh, more than 40,000 years now. So clearly the shelters can survive for 40,000 plus years. Some of the mineral accretions can be used to date the art and the survival of the rock art is limited in two ways, chemically and geochemically by the reactive um, accretions that are, that are uh, particularly those lateral fringes which are encroaching from the edge and the microbial communities that they support um, and the exfoliation, the physical mechanism which is, occurs all over the, the rock surfaces and ultimately is the, the final uh, arbiter on the longevity of the, um, the, the rock paintings. And of course the uh, direct exposure to intense fire is something that needs to be prevented. There's a huge number of people to thank. I'm not going to try and list them, but I've put them all down. The, I'm not going to try and say them all, but particularly I've just mentioned Augie and Hango, the senior traditional owner for the areas we've been working on over the last um, uh, six years. And he's been wonderful to us and his uh, the younger uh, traditional owners that come out with us every day. Every sample we take in one of these rock shelters is explicitly permitted by one of these wonderful traditional owners that we that we work with. Uh, so it's all in fact in most the last few years most of the samples have been collected by the traditional owners. They know how to do it and it's it's wonderful to work with them. Huge number of researchers uh, and, a, and some fabulous uh, support people who supported us in the field. It's been a great privilege to um, do this work and the dating results that are coming out now, they're coming out right now in high uh, impact journals. Um, that's something I'll leave for another day to talk about. Thank you very much.